following obstacles, embracing failure, and everything getting harder as we get older. Here are seven life lessons we've learned from games. Why are you wasting your time playing games? They don't teach you anything. It's a comment you hear all the time from friends and relatives who don't share our hobby. They'd argue that the game bit suggests something frivolous and disposable that has nothing to teach us about our place in the universe. Well, in this video, we'll aim to prove those people wrong. Armed only with a Steam library and anecdotal evidence, I'll explore how games can teach us about perseverance, trust, and the gnawing inevitability of defeat. Think of it like the ready meal equivalent of a counter-argument, not as nourishing or as tasty as the real thing, but it'll do in a pinch. Let's look at seven lessons we can learn from games and see what, if anything, they can teach us about real life. On the face of it, games are great at teaching us the value of persistence. We often start with nothing, and through a mix of dedication and experimentation, we build skills, learn new abilities, and become stronger people. Whether it's crafting, fighting, driving, jumping, talking, cooking, even drinking, games teach us we'll get better at anything if we do it repeatedly. Now there's some truth to this. Obviously, you only get better at stuff if you try. And I say this with the complete confidence of a man whose self-improvement plan involves planning self-improvement right up until the point where they actually have to do anything. So many of us do get better at real life things like cooking or driving just through repetition. So far, so realistic. But we have to temper this one with evidence. It's something we've looked at in another video with help of self-improvement expert Joel Snape. And it turns out not only do you need the right kind of practice to really improve, but you also need to keep doing it or you'll slide back and become just as useless as you were when you first started. So while games like Tomb Raider and Far Cry teach us that with time, persistence and duct tape, we'll eventually be able to make our own rifle ammo and napalm, it's not something you should be trying at home. So as a means of providing a tangible, far less dangerous example, I've had a go at crafting some axes out of stuff I found in my house. So this is my first attempt. This is the bathroom axe and it's made using a loofah and whatever this is. And number two is the home office special, which as you can see, has a much sharper axe head, but doesn't have the structural integrity. And finally, we have my favorite of the lot, the kitchen axe. Easily the best so far, but it's still just a pizza cutter duct tape to a spatula. But the point here isn't that games can teach us to make axes, that's not something we should be encouraging, but that games still teach us the value of persistence, even when the results are slightly unrealistic. You know the scenario. You enter a new area in a game, start soaking up the ambience, and then, just as you're getting comfortable, some feculent, helpless quest spigot starts begging for assistance with tasks that are completely beneath your legendary hero. Now we all know what we should say. No, I won't help you find the missing pages from your dog's favorite poetry book. And I'm entirely too busy saving the world to deliver an envelope of your hair and feelings to the boy you fancy at the local tavern. But do we do it? No, of course not. The lure of reward is always too much. Or to put it more accurately, the lure of resolution. Because deep down, we all know that only 50% of side quests in which you help strangers will end happily there's just as much chance that whoever you're helping will see your kindness as a sign of weakness and try to rob you. But we can learn from this. The next time a stranger asks you for help in real life, remember that games have prepared you for this moment. If you're naturally cynical, imagine you'll get an epic reward if you point someone in the direction of the dry cleaners. And if you're nervous around pushy people, just pretend you're the hero in your own game. You're not Gary from IT support, you're the Dragonborn. And the Dragonborn doesn't empty bins for anybody. Pathfinding in games is usually so good that you only notice when it fails and you end up down a dead end, trying doors that don't work, wondering where it all went wrong. But most of the time we have an instinctive feel for the correct path. This is because developers use all kinds of beguiling tricks to keep us heading in the correct direction. These include colors, lights, glowing trails of breadcrumbs, and weirdest of all, people who are trying to kill us. We've talked about why games do this here, but usually, if you're in any doubt about what direction to go next, you just look for the nearest enemy. Our journeys in games are marked by dead people behind us, not dead people in front of us. So this life lesson essentially is that we can navigate by following obstacles, like sat-nav, but with more uppercuts. 
In this context, it makes no sense at all. I'm about as streetwise as a chinchilla in a gang war, and even I understand the need to walk briskly away from increasingly large men who intend to cause me harm. But let's think about this philosophically, or at least in a way that allows me to keep talking without changing the name of this video. Can we actually learn anything from this? Well, yes, sort of. If we're in a new place for the first time in real life, we're more likely to use the same streets as everyone else. There's something reassuring about places that aren't deserted. And in real life, paths only exist because people continue to use them. Once they're abandoned, they disappear like defeated enemies in a side-scrolling beat-em-up. So let's just agree that games get this right, not in a finding your way to the library by fighting goons kind of way, although I suppose that depends what kind of libraries you go to, but more by harnessing our natural tendency to gravitate towards other people. I say, old bean, could you possibly tell me the way- Oh my god! Most games feature incremental difficulty. They get harder as we keep playing, and the final moments are often the most challenging. There are outliers, of course, and certain new powers will provide moments where we feel more capable, but generally, things start easy and get worse. And this is one that has obvious crushing parallels with real life. As we get older, our bodies fail and our reactions begin to slow. And this is something I can relate to on a personal level, as a man who's read your comments about me playing Fortnite. My shoe is better at Fortnite than this guy. I removed my own eyes just so I could stop watching this. And this guy puts the lame in Glamour, which doesn't even make sense. Luckily, games are very accommodating. Whatever your age or relative skill level, there's something out there for you. The multiplayer threat of Fortnite, for example, might be too much, but you could still flourish at the measured single-player challenge of Dark Souls. And if you're still struggling, there's always point-and-click adventures, which are essentially retirement homes for ageing gamers. Thimbleweed Park even sounds like the sort of place you'd see out your twilight years. So in some respects, a life spent playing games and occasionally being reminded of your own eventual failure is great practice for getting old. And when you do get old, a shady even time of peaceful point-and-click adventures awaits you. That leads us on to our next point. If you play games, you're going to fail. It's inevitable. People who never fail at games are like people who are actually good at karaoke. Yes, it's impressive, but we can't be annoyed and impressed at the same time. But failure in games teaches us to dust ourselves down, realign any damaged bones, and try again. Now, this is obviously useful because, as my own seemingly limitless inadequacy has taught me, we will fail in real life too, and learning to deal with it is very healthy. Games teach us that after the thigh-punching, NPC-cursing frenzy has passed, you're left with the clammy realisation that you're not going anywhere unless you deal with it. Of course, there are some kinds of failure in games that are best avoided IRL. Being killed by monsters, being crushed by rocks, being killed by monsters that look like rocks. But that recurring message of picking yourself back up after you get knocked down is a positive one, not least because you can learn from your mistakes and find a plan B. So the next time you get rejected for a job or you miss out on your dream home, remember the lessons that games have taught us. If the direct approach didn't work, you can always try crawling through the air vents to get what you want. I mean metaphorical air vents, of course. Please stay out of the real ones. Let's stay with air vents for the moment because they're gaming shorthand for our next point. Games also teach us the value of creative thinking. Many of the greatest games of all time, Deus Ex, Dishonored, Metal Gear Solid, all demonstrate the power of thinking outside the box. And yes, I did just pick MGS5 so I could make the box joke. This is the sort of thing that's impossible to explain to people who don't play games, because it's everything they don't understand about games combined with everything they don't understand about using their imaginations. So in a very meta way, it's up to us to educate them using the knowledge we've gained playing games. Demonstrate your map reading skills by finding alternate routes through busy cities. Use your diplomacy talents to defuse family conflicts. Put sleeping potions in your best friend's soup so you can steal his things while he's unconscious. All right, maybe not the last one. Terrible examples aside, this is a useful thing to learn. If we all gave up the first time a game challenged us, none of us would ever complete anything. But we don't, we persevere. And one of the most satisfying things you can do in a game is recognize when your methods aren't working, find a new path, and ultimately succeed. Or, you know, just cheese it, it still counts. 
And we've left the most powerful entry until last. Perhaps the most important thing games can teach us is that the hours of grind are all worth it, if only to glimpse the rainbow of success for one fleeting moment. OK, perhaps that's too lofty a way to describe defeating a giant vegetable in Cuphead. But there's a very real lesson here about the value of success. Most of us don't play games to get rich. There's no tangible reward for doing well. But completing a task is in itself an achievement, and we can apply that sense of motivation to everything we do. Just think about all the hard stuff you've already done in games. Kept your nerve during a deathmatch, outflanked an opponent in an RTS, spent all evening trying to beat Ornstein and Smau. You've already done stuff that will make most people flip their keyboards and quit. So the next time you get halfway through something and feel the temptation to stop, just ask yourself, would you do the same if you were playing a game? The chances are those difficulty spikes motivate you to try even harder. Smash that paperwork like it's a big daddy in Bioshock. Learn your French vocab like you're collecting doodads in Assassin's Creed. Demand your pay rise like you're forcing surrender in Total War. Go on, Gary, keep trying, you're a tiger. You've got this. So there we go. Hopefully, we've provided you with some compelling counter-arguments against anyone who runs down your hobby. Or just made you feel special if your name is Gary and you work in IT support. Please share the life lessons you've learnt from playing games in the comments below, hit that like button if anything here sounded vaguely familiar, and subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly shows and features.